Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. This is Lecture 3, or 2B, in Week 8, and we're talking about electrochemical sensors. And as I said at the beginning of this week, this is often electroanalytical chemistry is a topic for several weeks in these classes. So you're really just getting a brief overview of it. Uh, your inline, your online textbook, excuse me, has a lot of it more. If you have the time and interest, you can go through about three or four chapters on electroanalytical. We're really focusing right now on chapter 21. So in this lecture, we're going to be continuing our discussion of potentiometry, but we're going to be looking at a separate case, a more practical case, or rather common case, which is the application of ion selective electrodes, in which differential buildup of charge at an interface, much like the junction potential, is actually leveraged as a means for measuring the concentration of analytes. So an ion selective electrode will convert the concentration of an analyte in solution into a known electrical potential. And the classic ion selective electrode is the pH meter. So over here to the left is kind of a picture of the pH meter. You might have used one before. They're very delicate. They have these glass bulbs on the end that can easily break because they're very thin. And what's going on is inside of that bubble of glass is a simple sodium chloride solution with no protons, no, no hydronium ions in it. And you've got a wire that's measuring the potential. And it's measuring the potential of the solution relative to the glass. And that's kind of what you're most interested in, in characterizing. And the reason the glass builds up a charge is because the glass itself can take in hydronium ions. Think of the glass as kind of like a sponge. And that sponge is filled with sodium. But if there's enough hydronium ions, then the hydronium ions will come in, the sodium will leave. But that is only happening on the outside part of the glass. On the inside part, you're actually getting a converse. You're building up a slight negative charge because you have the positive charge here. And so what that does is it creates, basically, a boundary potential. And that boundary potential is proportional through something that looks just like the Nernst equation to the concentration of analyte in solution. So briefly, then, what's going on in an ion-selective electrode is there's a material. Now, for pH, that material is going to be pretty much straight up glass. And glass is a network of siloxanes. And there's actually a lot of open space in glass, such that ions can, especially cations, can go in and be stabilized by the interactions with the oxygens in a siloxane network. And it turns out particular types of glass are really, really good at stabilizing H+. And so sodium leaves, H plus comes in. And that's the basis for building up on one side that's in contact with let's say, an acidic solution, a different potential than what's on the inside and in contact with just you know, a potassium chloride solution. So you can also, and we'll talk about this briefly later, by manipulating the glass or manipulating the substance that's between the two things you're trying to measure, you can, for example, derive electrodes that are selected for silver or sodium or other substances. So we're just sticking with pH, which is a simple glass. It's very, very thin. And it's the migration of hydronium into the hydrated layer of the glass that actually builds up with something, builds up its boundary potential. So this boundary potential is really governed by something that looks a lot like the Nernst equation, which is that equation that relates the electrochemical potential to the concentrations present. I'm not going to derive this. Your book does a pretty good job of that. But what we know about the boundary potential is it's going to be the difference in the potential at the inside of that membrane. So the side of the solution that's just potassium chloride and the outside, the side that's facing the analyte solution. And so what happens is in the case where the concentration is 10 times on the outside what it is on the inside, we can see that this expression, the log, is going to be the log of 10 or it's going to be 1. And we're going to have a boundary potential of 0 0.0592 volts. So for every 10 times greater concentration outside than inside, we get a change of 0 0.0592 volts. And that's a change of a pH unit. So that gives you a sense of how precise we have to be in our readings, because 0 0.0592 volts, or 59.2 millivolts, is a whole pH change. So we better have really good volt, um, voltmeters, which we do, so we can measure pretty small volt readings. OK, so what if the concentration inside and outside were equal? Well, in that case, you're going to have a log of 1, which is 0, and then you're not going to measure any difference. But if it's the other way around, for some strange reason, then of course you would go the other way. 
So the boundary voltage then is going to just be equal to a constant plus 0 0.0592 times the pH. And the constant is an interesting term because it's first of all got the fact that there is some hydronium on the inside, A2, as is this expression calls it. And if you know that, you can correct. So even if you have pure water, you'll have 10 to the minus 7 hydronium ions, and you're going to have to add that correction in. You've also got other factors that contribute, and your book goes into these. I won't expect you to know these, but if you're curious, you can go read more about them. But basically, the boundary potential is going to be 0 0.0592 times the pH of the solution with this extra term added on that should be a constant over the range of pHs you measure. Now, ion selective electrodes, as I said, don't just have to be for pH. Um, they can be for a lot of different things. In this case, this is a potassium ion exchange electrode, and it's very, very small. And so that allows it to interact or measure, for example, potassium through tissue at very specific places. It's a little too big to do the single cell measurements like I showed you in the last lecture. It's 125 micron tip. But nevertheless, it can be pretty accurate in its measure of potassium. So it's really great for electrophysiology studies, for example, in muscles. Some other examples of ion selective electrodes. Um, while I'm showing you these beakers that seem to have electrodes in them, you should be aware that the real world, we don't do it that way. Um, advances in microelectronics, the same thing that make our cell phones possible, have made it possible to miniaturize these sensors. And this, this is probably one of my favorite examples. This is a screwdriver, and what it's sitting on is a slab of steak, raw steak. And you can stick this screwdriver pH meter into steak, and you can measure the pH of steak, which has some value, apparently. Um, and so that's just kind of a cool example. And you can see that it's not got a real electrochemical cell in there. It's actually a miniaturized version of the kinds of things that we were talking about. And it's actually based on something called a field, um, basically a field effect transistor, uh, which is a really interesting kind of sensor for measuring electrochemical potential of a sort. And your book has a nice discussion about it if you want to go read it. And a lot of the sensors you're finding everywhere, you know, especially, you know, whether it's in a car engine to measure something about how much oxygen is coming out of your uh, combustion process, which you hope not is not a lot, or, you know, CO monitors in your house. These are all very miniaturized sensors, usually based on our ability to microfabricate um, various types of electronic device structures. So it's sort of a solid state version of these electrochemical fuel cells. A really, really far out example is this recent example from um, PLOS One. Now I'm using this as an example because you can go and for free print out this paper. It's something called an open source journal. So there are, is free to the world to read. And I love this example because a really big area of research that's coming up in the United States at least is what's called the mapping of the human brain or the desire to actually as we think and speak and sleep not just get those MRI images about what part of the brain is active but know what's the oxygen concentration. What are the levels of neurotransmitters doing spatially and temporally? And so one way to do that is to start to develop nanoscale sensors that can be implanted deep inside people's brains and report back information. And because these can be so small, they, while they're invasive, are less invasive than some of the larger um, electrodes that have been used to date. So this is an example of an electrode that has a tip that has consisting of these multi-wall nanotubes. And it's five microns, so it's exquisitely small exquisitely small set of sensors and it sits kind of on a larger base that is the piece that goes into the brain. So it's small but it's not that small at the end of the day but they're getting better and better. And I just wanted to show that this is actually a potentiometric sensor because it was able to measure as a function of time the firing of individual neurons. And so what you see here is a trace of millivolts of the sensor had been pushed down about a millimeter and you can see all these different neurons firing and you can blow up one of these in time and see a very particular pattern which if you read the paper they talk about how they analyze that pattern to convince themselves that it was basically a burst of neurons firing or a certain type of uh, process among many neurons. So this is an example of what you can do with potentiometric sensors where you're measuring the potential um, between two electrodes. You can, of course, we talked about it in a liquid cell but a lot of what's going on now is are these solid state electrodes that are kind of just plunked directly into a piece of tissue, in this case, the brain. So I thought this was a pretty cool example. Anyhow, that brings us to the end of our 
basic discussion of potentiometric sensors. In the next lecture, I'll talk about a couple of examples, and we'll kind of compare them to some of the other tools that we've used to analyze for things like metals. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time.